All right, let's get started for today. Um, welcome to our uh, fifth lecture. A couple of announcements. Your homework one on search was due yesterday. If you didn't finish it yesterday, it's too late. Um, but keep it in mind, every week there's a homework due on Monday night. So keep track of that. One thing that happens after the homework has been due is that a new button will show up in edX. It says show answer. If you click the show answer button, it won't just show you the correct answer, it will also show you explanations of why this is the correct answer. So if you're wondering why you got it right, now you can go check and see the explanations. Your project one on search is due on Friday at five. Uh, make sure you start early, especially if you haven't started yet, start soon. Your homework two um, is about to be released, will be due next week, Monday, it'll be on CSPs. For section, um, if you wanna be in a more or less crowded section, depending on your preferences, check Piazza. We'll keep posting there how many students are attending each section, and that way you can go to a section of the amount of attendance that you find uh, preferable. Any questions about logistics? Yes? Okay, there's a question about the overflow discussion sections. So this week we still have overflow discussion sections, meaning section slots that are allocated to accommodate overflow of the regular discussion sections. Starting next week, these same slots will be allocated to exam practice sessions. So that starts next week. And so next week you'll have your first exam practice session if you want to attend. And um, these will cover uh, search. Any other questions about logistics? All right, let's dive right in then. So this is our second lecture on constraint satisfaction problems. What we're studying today is how to efficiently solve CSPs. We've already seen some of it last time, we'll see some more of it this time. And then we'll look at something called local search. It's a new kind of search algorithm that is particularly relevant for CSPs, but also has applicability beyond CSPs. All right, so what was a CSP? A CSP was defined by a set of variables each variable has a domain associated with it, the set of values that variable is allowed to take on. And then there was a set of constraints. Constraints satisfy what combinations of values are okay for a set of variables to take on. They could be specified implicitly, just some kind of function call that says whether a constraint is satisfied or not, or explicitly by a set of pairs of values for a binary constraint or a set of triples of values for ternary constraints and so forth. When we say unary constraint, that's a constraint that involves only one variable. A binary constraint involves two variables. Enary constraints involve n variables. The goal here is to find any solution in what we're doing, but you can imagine extensions of the type of problem we're looking at where you're asked to find all solutions to a CSP. In fact, we've asked this in past exams, in lecture, we only cover how to find a solution, but now I say, well, what happens if we change the algorithm to try to find all solutions and ask you questions for that algorithm? That's a variation of what we've seen in lecture. Our canonical example was this uh, map coloring problem, but again, not all CSPs are map coloring problems. In fact, most of the real world ones are not map coloring problems, um, but it's a nice way to illustrate the concepts that we're covering here. And so in the map coloring problem, we'd have a set of variables corresponding to each of the nodes in the graph. Each node can be colored in, in any of a set of available colors, and neighboring nodes cannot have the same color. The basic algorithm we saw is called backtracking search. It's a depth-first search, really, slightly reformulated, and let's step through it in a little bit of detail here, because it's our uh, foundation for the next few slides. So we start with an empty assignment to all variables, so no variables have been assigned yet. Then we'll select a variable for assignment from the set of unassigned variables. Initially, that could be any variable. Then we loop over all 
values available in the domain of that variable. We'll look at the first value here, first time we go around in the loop. We check if that value, if we were to assign it, leads to a constraint violation. If it does, then we skip over it essentially because it's not useful to keep going with that value assignment. If it doesn't, then we work with that assignment and we make a recursive call here to backtracking where now this variable has been assigned that particular value. It's going deeper in our search tree. Okay. If that recursive call somehow returns with success, that'll propagate all the way back up. We'll have found an assignment that satisfies all constraints. If it returns with failure, it means it somehow couldn't find a value for one of the next variables that was consistent with the constraints. You'll see that here when it comes back, back up and you'll move on to the next value for that variable going around this loop over here. Okay, so that's backtracking search. What are, what are our choice points? We have a choice point over here, which variable to assign next. We have a choice point here, which value to look at first and then which one next and so forth. And we also have this idea of filtering that we looked at last time and what we did there is after we made an assignment, we would prune the domains. So this would actually be inserted somewhere in here. After the assignment is made, we could use some kind of filtering to reduce the domains as we're going down that branch of the search tree. It could be forward checking, it could be our consistency. There are different ways of doing filtering, but that's where that would happen. It would be inside the backtracking algorithm. Often it would also, if you run R consistently, it would also run right before you start your RM to make all the domains, uh, all the variable domains are consistent. Okay, so even though we have some ideas here on how to speed up the search, keep in mind this is still an MP hard problem, meaning that it's believed that there is no efficient solution to this type of problem, but often, and in general, but often in practice, you might still find a solution pretty quickly if you are lucky, so to say. Um, filtering was the idea of checking for failure early rather than going all the way till you realize that you cannot find a value for a certain variable to assign. You check earlier on how your current assignments affect what values are still valid for the other variables. Um, we'll now revisit quickly MRV and LCV heuristics, because we had to do that kind of quickly last time, and there were some questions that came up after lecture about it, and then we'll start looking at the main meat of this lecture for CSPs, which is how to exploit structure of the constraint satisfaction graph. So ordering, it's a question here, both for variables and for values, in which order are you going to choose them in your algorithm? Let's first look at um, variables. So we're looking here at Variable ordering, so which variable to pick next. The heuristic we propose is the minimum remaining values heuristic. What does that mean? It means you choose the variable with the fewest legal values left in its domain. Yeah, what kind of behavior does that give rise to? Let's say you're doing map coloring and you color something first because initially they all have the same number of remaining values. If you use the MRV heuristic, Next that will happen is you'll pick a neighboring state to the one you already colored because the neighboring states will have less values remaining than the other states. And so you'll pick one of the neighboring states. At this point, there's a state that has only one value remaining. You'll pick that one next and you proceed that way. Okay, so why would we go with the minimum remaining values rather than maybe maximum remaining values? Suggestion there. So the su suggestion was, if we go with minimum remaining values, we'll get failure as fast as possible because we first look at the parts of, or the sets of variables that have the least options left. And so that's where most likely we would fail based on the information we have so far and where we could fail the quickest by considering what happens there. Um, very related to that, if you look at your search tree, um, it's branching on all possible values, and the less values that are remaining, the lower the branching factor of your search tree. And remember, search scales 
exponential uh, scales, the, the bottom thing, so you have branching factor to power depth. It's exponential in the depth, but the base of that, of what you take the power of here, B, depends on your branching, it's your branching factor, and so the smaller you can keep B, the better. And so you pick a variable with very few values remaining, the branching will be smaller. Okay, so we pick the worst scenario first when we look at variables. Um, let's take a look at what this looks like in our applet here. So we, just a reminder, this is a map coloring problem. Um, we'll look at backtracking search. We'll use the minimum remaining value heuristic to choose the next variable. Um, we'll use forward checking to prune our domains. You need to use some kind of filtering. Otherwise, you cannot use the minimum remaining value heuristic because all domains will just stay the same if you don't use any kind of filtering. So we'll use forward checking as our filtering step. So let's see how this plays out. So first, all of them are equal in terms of size of domains. So we just started at the bottom left as before. At this point, two of the domains after forward checking have become smaller, these two. I'll pick one of those two, some kind of tie-breaking scheme. Fix this one now. The one at the top is only one value remaining. That one will be prioritized. So that one's picked next. And this keeps going this way, always looking at which variables have the least values left, assigning those that val variable first. We're still going down depth first in our search tree. And in fact, in this case, we found the solution without ever having to backtrack. That's not guaranteed. There's no such guarantee, but the heuristic helps us reduce backtracking, and in this case, reduce it by quite a lot, namely to zero backtracking. Okay. So this is also called the most constrained variable heuristic, and it's a fail fast ordering. You wanna find out as soon as possible if down a certain branch of the search tree, you would fail. Now we still have to choose which value to assign first for each variable. Remember, in the backtracking search algorithm, we are looping here over all possible value assignments. So, least constraining values are heuristic here. So what does that mean? Given a choice of variable, we choose the one that constrains us the least. So we have to define what it means to constrain the least. Um, okay, well, let's consider a value for assignment. Let's then run some kind of filtering, assuming that assignment, and see how much we prune out of our other variables domains. And we can count how many values get pruned. If this assignment and then filtering results in a lot of pruning, that's a very constraining assignment. If it results in very little pruning, that value is not as much constraining. You can compute the, what you measure, how you measure constraining in a few ways. One way to measure is how many values get pruned out of your domains. Another way to measure is what's the size of the smallest domain left. So maybe you reduce one of the domains to zero. That's quite interesting in some sense. So you might want to prioritize by that and say that's very constraining. Um, but what you want here is the least constraining value. So you want it to be as little constraining as possible. Why is that what we want to do? Over there. So the intuition is correct. By picking the least constraining value, you leave the most options open. You have the highest chance of success, okay? So you order your values looking at the ones with highest chance of success first, okay? In some sense, it's a little counterintuitive what we did on the previous slide for variables. So you might say, why don't we want to fail fast? Well, let's assume we did fail fast. What are we going to do next? We're going to look at the next value for that variable. Let's assume we failed fast again. We're gonna look at the next value for that variable. Until we've looked at a value for that variable that actually succeeds, oh, we've enumerated all values for that variable and it always failed. 
If we end up having to enumerate all and they all fail, the ordering doesn't matter. Any ordering will have the same running time. If one of the assignments or one or more of the assignments for that variable lead to a success, the earlier we have that success, the quicker our search will be. So here, we want to look at the value first that has the highest chance of succeeding. Now, this least constraining value is just a heuristic. It's not actually a probability in any formal sense of succeeding with that assignment, but it guides us in the right direction in many cases. All right. So combining minimum remaining value for variable assignment and least constraining value for the value ordering, um, we can solve up to a thousand Queens problems. Okay, filtering wise, we looked at forward checking. We looked at our consistency. Now we'll go beyond our consistency. So remember our consistency is where you consider a binary constraint between two variables. It's a directed arc associated with when we say arc, it's going from one variable to the other variable, and we always take values out of the tail of that arc. So just as a reminder, what happens here, um, let's say we run our consistency for this This particular problem here, we already have two states assigned. We now cycle through all arcs, some of them repeatedly as we know. So first arc here, for every value in the tail, which is V, we need to check, is there a compatible value at the head? So for red, is there a compatible value at the head? Yes, blue. For green, yes, both of them would be compatible. For blue, um, red would be compatible. So we cannot prune anything from the tail here. Next star, how about here? Um, we look at all values for the tail variable. The only value is blue. Is there a compatible value at the head? Yes, there is, namely red, so nothing can be pruned. Moving on, looking at the arc in the other direction, um, we have first value red. Is there a compatible value at the head? Yes, blue. Next value blue, is there a compatible value at the head? No, because the only value avail available is blue, and blue and blue are not compatible, so we prune blue from the tail. Look at the next arc. Oh, that's the first one again. But the domain of the head variable has changed, and that's why we're reconsidering it. Um, so what's happening here? We again look at red. Is that still okay in the tail? No, it's not, because it's not compatible with red. Green and blue are still okay. So remember, that was our consistency, but not just doing it for a few arcs. You do it for all arcs, keep cycling through them, in a structured way until all of them are consistent. Yes? Um, the arc, refer arc here refers to a directed edge that runs between two variables for which there is a constraint in the constraint satisfaction problem. All right, so what are the possible results after you have run our consistency. Any of these possibilities are, are possible outcomes. You can have one solution left, meaning every variable has one value left in its domain. At that point, you know you have a solution. Why? All constraints are satisfied for this specific choice of values of all the variables, so that is a solution. You can have more than one value left in some of the domains, in which case there could be multiple solutions left or there could be no solutions left and you wouldn't know it. An example of that is shown over here. Multiple values left in all of the domains in this case, but actually there is no solution to this problem, but you don't know it from just running our consistency. It's also possible that some domain goes empty, at which point you know there is no solution down this path in the search tree and you backtrack. Okay, so Keep in mind, this still runs inside the backtracking search. You run this every time after you make an assignment to a variable, you run our consistency as a filtering step. Um, you might also run it before you choose a value to assign to see which value is the least constraining value. So you might actually run it twice in that search. You might cache the results to make it more efficient. That's our consistency. It just considers constraints between pairs of variables. 
Now let's take it to the next level. And let's take a look at something called K consistency. It's a generalization of R consistency. One, K equal one consistency or node consistency is enforcing for each single node that the domain only has values that meet the unary constraints. R consistency or two consistency makes sure that all binary constraints are satisfied. So for each pair of nodes, constraints between those pairs are satisfied. Now, K consistency looks at bigger groups of nodes, K, no, K variables at once, and a set of domains is K consistent if for each K nodes, any consistent assignment to K minus one of the variables can be extended to the K variable. Okay. So for example, three consistency would be you'd look at any subset of three variables. From that subset of three variables, you'd first take two, find a consistent assignment for those, any set of consistent assignments for those two, and make sure that for any of those consistent assignments for those two, there's still a compatible assignment left in the third variable's domain. This is more expensive than just our consistency. You can imagine if you think this through carefully, you essentially get exponential scaling in the number of in the number k here. But it is a generalization of our consistency that at times can be useful. It's a more expensive filtering step, but it'll filter more so you could get benefit from doing more expensive filtering, reduce your branching factor. We'll only need to we'll only re require you to know how it exactly works for k equal two, but we want you to be aware that larger K exists also. Strong K consistency refers to the fact that consistency is true for K equal one, K equal two, oh sorry, for one consistency is true, two consistency is true, all the way till K consistency. Um, if N consistency is true with N the number of variables, then we can now solve the problem without backtracking. Why? Well, Based on one consistency, you can pick any variable. You'll know there is a consistent value with the unary constraints for that variable. You pick it from a tr its current domain. Then from two consistency, you can pick any other variable, give it a compatible assignment to the one you already assigned before. Then thanks to three consistency having been enforced, now you can pick a third variable and there will be in its domain a, var a value that's consistent with the first two you already, already assigned and you can keep going all the way till n you solved your problem, no backtracking at all. Of course, you would have done a lot of work to enforce this inconsistency, but in principle, you could do it that way. All right, now let's start, take a look at how we can exploit structure of the graph. Simplest way to exploit structure of the graph is when there are independent subproblems. So here we have two sub-problems. In principle, we can solve them separately because there's no constraints coupling them. It makes it often more efficient than solving it all as one big problem. Okay? The way you then identify that is just to check that your graph falls apart into pieces and you can solve each piece independently. Okay, what kind of speed up does that give us? So let's say there are n variables and it can, the problem can be broken into sub-problems where each sub-problem only contains C variables. That means there are N over C sub-problems, okay? What's the worst case solution cost then? Each sub-problem has a running time of D to the power C. D is the domain size. C is the size of the sub-problem, the number of variables. We have N over C sub-problems, so running time N over C times d to the power c, okay? Compare this to the naive way of solving it, which would be d to the n, with n a lot larger than n over c, if c is small, namely you have a lot of small subproblems. Okay, so let's have c equal Actually, let's 
let's have c equal 20, d equal 2, n equals 80. If we compare the two running times, we have 4 billion years at some compute cost for the naive solution and 0 0.4 seconds for the solution that splits it up into separate subproblems. So the speed up can be tremendous. Of course, it's a very strong assumption that your problem breaks up into separate problems. I mean, that's like saying you're going to solve the classroom scheduling problem for Berkeley and for Stanford as one classroom scheduling problem, even though they're clearly separate problems. And typically, that's, that's how it'll be. It'll only break up into separate problems when really you should have, from the beginning, have realized these are separate problems. But at least it gives us some intuition as if we could break it up into separate subproblems, we would gain a lot in terms of running time. Okay, so we'll now look at a different kind of structure, tree structure, which doesn't require separate problems. Everything can be connected in some way, but only as a tree, and we'll still find efficient solutions. So the theorem we're going to establish is that if the constraint graph has no loops, meaning it's a tree structured constraint graph, the CSP can be solved in order n, which is number of variables, times d squared time. Again, contrast this with the worst case running time for a backtracking search d to the n. Exponential in n versus just linear in n. We'll later see when we cover base nets that a generalization of this also applies when we do probabilistic inference for probability distributions with large sets of variables where the structure in the distribution can be modeled with a tree structure. All right, so let's take a look at the algorithm. Then we'll look at the running time, and then we'll look at why it even works. So first, the algorithm. First step is to choose a root variable and order the variables so that parents precede children. What do I mean with that? It means you grab one of the nodes of the graph, hang up the graph by that node, let it just hang, and pick an ordering consistent with how the graph is hanging. You have many options here. Right? You could have picked any of those six variables as the one you pick up. We could pick the graph up by. And then even for a fixed variable like A that you decide to hold the graph up by, you can still have multiple linearizations. That's what these are called. For example, you could have just as well have moved this C variable here all the way at the end, put it there. That would still be a linearization of that graph starting from A. And you just need to follow the partial ordering defined by the edges in the graph, holding it by its root, everything hanging down. Okay, but we picked one particular linearization, this one here. Then let's assume these are the domains of the variables. Okay. Now let's take a look at what happens when we run the backward pass. So the first thing we do is run a backward pass which means that we remove inconsistent values on these arcs going from right to left. So let's do that. So we start with the first arc, which goes from D to F. We remove from the tail, which is D. Blue is not compatible with only having blue at F, so that disappears. Then we go on to E. We have an arc from D to E. We enforce consistency of that arc. Um, for both red and green, there is a compatible value at E, so nothing gets pruned. We move on to the arc from D to B. We check if anything needs to be pruned from the domain of B. Um, for both green and blue, there are compatible values in D, so nothing gets pruned. Then we go on to the arc from B to C. Uh, here, green doesn't have a compatible value in C, so it needs to be removed. Blue has a compatible value, can stay. Then we go to the last arc here from A to B. We prune from the tail. Blue is not compatible with some, anything that's left in B. Red is. So this is our backward pass. Okay. Note that we didn't put all arcs onto a queue like we typically do in arc consistency. We just go from right to left and force this set of arcs. That's it. Next step is a forward assignment. So now, now we run left to right. 
and assign values. So we'll go this way now. What's left for A? Red. So let's just pick red. What's left for B? Blue. So let's pick blue. What's left for C? Um, all that's left is green. So we pick green. What's left for D? Red and green. Now, we need to make sure that what we pick when we have choice is compatible with anything we already picked before. So what did we pick before that relates to D, B, which has blue? Well, both of these values are compatible. So we could pick either red or green. The algorithm doesn't tell us which one to pick. We can choose whatever we prefer. Let's pick green. We go on to E. We have two values remaining for E, green and blue. We have to check that it, the value we pick is consistent with what we have picked so far. So we look back along this arrow here, which is the only thing we picked so far that influences E. Um, we pick green there, so we can't pick green now for E, so we pick blue. Then we move on to the next one, F. Um, only one value remaining, blue, we pick that. At this point, we have an assignment to these variables that is consistent and solves the problem. Okay, so what's the running time of this? Well, it's order n d squared. Why is that? Well, in the backward pass, all we do is enforce our consistency for pairs of variables. Enforcing our consistency for a single arc takes d squared time. We do it for order n variables because a tree can only have order n edges. So um, order n d squared for the backward pass. The forward pass, we look at each variable and make sure the assignment is compatible with anything we've assigned so far that affects this variable. Well, what have we assigned so far that affects its variable? The only thing that affects it is its single parent variable. As you can notice here, every variable is only one parent, and so we need to do only just one check there. That's order d squared. Okay, so that's the running time. Now, how do we know this is guaranteed to work? First claim is that after the backward pass, all root to leaf arcs are consistent. What do I mean with root to leaf arcs? Those are all the arcs shown over here. The ones that run left to right are the root to leaf arcs. Why is that true? Well, we work our way from right to left. For example, we, st we started here. We enforced consistency of this arc by pruning from this domain. After we enforce consistency of that arc, it's consistent. And this can never be undone. Why? The only way we can undo consistency of an arc is by pruning from its head. But since we work right to left, after we consider an arc, we'll never be pruning from its head anymore. We've already passed that variable. And so we never make it inconsistent after we made it consistent. So as we go right to left, we make things consistent, never undo anything. And so we know once we've done that full pass, we've made all arcs consistent. Okay, second claim. If these arcs are consistent, if we follow a form and forward assignment, we will never have to backtrack, meaning we can never make the wrong choice as we run forward. Why is that? Okay, let's think about this. Let's say we're at some point in this forward run. Maybe we are about to assign C. We've already assigned A. We've already assigned B. Now we're assigning C. Okay. At this point, to make sure the assignment of C is compatible with everything we've done so far, we just need to check the arc coming into C. There's always only one arc because that's what it means to be tree structured and to have a linearization this way. So we choose a value that's compatible with C's parent. That's always possible because that's what this thing ensures over here. There might be more than one option. So the question is, can we make the wrong choice here? Can we somehow pick the wrong value for this variable C. Or let's pick a different one in this case here. Let's pick 
Um, let's assume we're working on D. Could we pick the wrong value for D if we have multiple options? Let's think about this. We pick a value for D. It is consistent with what we've seen, we well, already assigned. But will we run into trouble later? I will argue we will not. And the reason I'm going to argue not is that as we get to later variables, let's say E, since the arc D to E is consistent, consistency means that any value remaining in the domain of D has a compatible value in the head, namely E. So no matter what we pick for D, there will be a compatible value at E. And the same is true for F. No matter what we pick at D, there will be a compatible value at F. That's what it means for those arcs to be consistent. So we cannot pick wrong. And so we can proceed left to right as we go forward, just making sure we're consistent with what we already assigned, but we don't have to worry about what's still coming because all the arcs are consistent. Okay? So why would this not work if your graph has cycles, right? Because we said this is an algorithm for tree structured CSPs and we just show that it works. Where does the assumption come in that it, this is tree structured? And where would it break if it was not? Okay, let's assume it's not tree structured, right? Let's take a look at what would happen if you hang up a non tree structured graph by one of the nodes, right? You hang it up, there would still be, you would see still cycles here. For example, you might see something like um, this over here, right? This is what you could get when it's not tree structured. There's one extra edge there making it not a tree, the original graph. Okay, so what happens? Let's say we are doing our pass left to right, and we're about to reach the variable D. Right. Okay, there's some values left in the domain of D. We will look at this arc here and say, well, can we pick a value from the domain that's compatible with what we chose at B? Yes, because we made the B to D arc consistent, meaning that for any value we picked at B, there will be something at D that matches. We can do the same thing for C. We can check which value of D can we pick that's compatible with what we chose at C, and there will be at least one value that's compatible. But there's no guarantee that the value that's compatible with C and the value that's compatible with B is the same value. Those might be different values. And so that's where it could go wrong, and at that point, there might be nothing left, or you might not know which choice to make, and so forth. So, that's where it breaks when your graph is not tree structured. Now you might say, um, tree structured graphs, that's all great. Do they happen a lot? Can we ensure maybe our graph is tree structured and so forth? Um, well, there are a couple of things you can do. The first thing is that sometimes you get to define what your problem is. You're solving a real world problem. You get to define that as a mathematical formalization as a CSP. And you might decide that maybe you're willing to ignore some real world consideration, make an approximation of your real world problem that results in a tree structured CSP. And then solve that tree structured CSP, which you know you can solve very quickly. And I'll give you a solution to something that's approximately the problem you really wanted to solve but it might be good enough for practical use. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that you say, well, I really want to stick with the original problem, but I still want to take advantage of this idea that somehow tree structure can be exploited. Okay, so let's look at this graph over here. If just we were to remove this variable, it would become a tree structured graph. So the question you might ask yourself, is there a way to start from this original graph, somehow get rid of that variable, solve the tree structured CSP, and use the solution to that smaller problem to maybe find a solution to the original bigger problem? And the answer is, yes, there is. So this is called cut set conditioning. What you do there is you pick one or more variables that if you were to remove those variables from your graph, your graph would become a tree structured graph. So in this case, 
just one variable needs to be removed, but sometimes you need to remove more than one variable to make your graph into a tree structured graph. Here, one variable is enough. Then you instantiate in all ways. In this case, that would be all three colors. Of course, your color problem, coloring problem is a little subtle because colors can be permuted, but in general, you instantiate for all possible values that set of variables. And then for that instantiation, each of those instantiations, check if you can find a solution for the remaining set of variables. Okay? Keep in mind that if you choose, in this case, this variable to instantiate, as you go to a new CSP over here, you need to still keep track of this variable. So let's take a look at what this looks like in the search on the next slide, and let's get back to the running time in a second. So here's what the algorithm looks like. You have this graph, you instantiate, you choose a cut set, you instantiate the variables on that cut set. What that means is you're actually branching on possible choices. Then you compute the residual CSP. What does that mean, the residual CSP? This is not just a CSP among those variables where you ignore the original variable completely. You actually account for the fact that you chose blue here. And so the fact that you chose blue there will affect the domain of each of these variables. The domains of all of, the, all of those variables will be pruned. In this case, blue will have been removed. And so what the residual CSP accounts for the assignment you made so far. Then you solve that residual CSP, maybe with a tree structure solution algorithm. If it finds a solution, great, you, you're done. You can pass this back up. If it doesn't find a solution, um, which can happen in your, if in your um, backward pass, domains become empty, then it could be, that's what signal there's no solution. Um, no, or it could happen in your forward pass. Actually, it cannot happen in your forward pass, but it can happen in your backward pass if your domains become empty, or in your forward pass, it would happen as you're doing assignments and you cannot find something consistent with the parent variable, so it can happen in either direction, but you would know that as you run the algorithm. If there's no solution, then you just backtrack. If there's a solution, you pass it back up and that's your solution. Now, it is possible there's no solution here and then you go down this branch of the search tree and maybe there's no solution there. You go down that branch and so forth. So that's how it all works out put together. So... If you had multiple variables part of your cut set, you would still have some kind of backtracking search at the top here. You would have multiple branchings, and then you'd have your tree structured solution. Okay, running time wise, what does that look like? Um, if you have a cut set of size C, then the number of instantiations of that set of variables is D to the C. Worst case, you might have to consider all of those D to the C instantiations of those variables. That's the branching at the top. And then for each of those instantiations, you have to now solve a tree structured CSP of size n minus c. And the running time for a tree structured CSP is number of variables n minus c times domain size squared. So this could be very fast. If there is a small cut set that breaks your graph or makes your graph into a tree structured graph. Okay, so let's do a little quiz on what a cut set is. So let's say this is your CSP graph. Um, you want to find a cut set to break this into a tree structured graph. Um, any thoughts on a cut set? Ideally, as few variables as possible in your cut set because that means the branching at the top would be less. Any thoughts? Over there. A and B is a suggestion. What happens if you take out A and B? You're just left with essentially this chain over here. And that's a, a chain is a special type of tree. And so that's a valid cut set. Turns out there's no smaller one. Just taking out one variable will not allow you to get a tree structure here. Okay, that's one way to take advantage of the structure of your graph, cut set conditioning then solving a tree structured CSP. Here is another thing you can do that also takes advantage of tree structure. This is a little more advanced, 
And this star here means that we don't expect you to kind of necessarily fully understand this for any kind of exam purposes, but we still think this is an important idea that we want you to be aware of, even though we will not explicitly quiz you on this. Yeah. So the idea here is that rather than taking variables out to get a tree structured CSP, we're going to use mega variables. What are these mega variables? Mega variables are a new type of variable that is a set of some subset of the original set of variables. Okay? So here would be one mega variable. It consists of WA, NT, and SA, all three of them. And together, that's a mega variable. Here's another mega variable, NT, Q, and SA. Here's another one, and another one. Okay. So look at what this looks like on this graph here. The first mega variable covers these three. The next mega variable covers these three. The next one covers these three. And the next one covers these last three over here. Okay. So let's make it clear that these are separate mega variables. Each of these mega variables has their own domain. Look at the domain here. There are three colors for each of the original variables. So this mega variable has three of the original variables. So each assignment to the mega variable is a choice of three colors. Same for the next one. And same for the next ones. Okay. Now, we will, in this reformulation of the problem, enforce that these mega variables have to agree on the variables that they share. So we see NT over here and SA over here, but we also see it over here and over here. And mega variable one and mega variable two, when they choose an assignment for NT and SA, they have to agree. Otherwise, it's just not allowed. So there's a new constraint. The constraint here is saying these two mega variables have to have compatible assignments to whatever is inside them. This is true here and here. So there's now two sets of constraints. The original constraints, which are sitting inside the mega variables, constraining the domains of the mega variables themselves. And then there is these compatibility constraints between mega variables saying that they have to assign consistent values to their shared variables. All right. So once we do this, we actually, what we see here is the same problem as the original problem, just reformulated. The solution to this new problem would be a set of, would be a set of assignments to these mega variables that would correspond to an assignment to the original variables, a single assignment to the original variables because the mega variables are forced to be consistent, and the values assigned to these original variables are okay because inside in these domains we've been enforcing that the constraints are satisfied, the original constraints. So we can, instead of solving the original problem, we could solve this problem with mega variables, okay? This new problem is tree structure. In fact, it's a chain, a special type of tree. So we've just turned our original problem into a tree structured new problem with new types of variables, bigger variables, bigger domains, but the running time for this is the running time of solving a tree structured problem. But remember, in the tree structured problem, there is the d squared, and this d now here will be the domain size of the mega variables, so it'll be a bigger d than it used to be. But still, we turn it into a tree structured problem. Um, you might ask, well, can we keep these domains of these mega variables pretty small? Can we find mega variables with only a few variables that participate in them? That will depend on the structure of your graph. For some graphs, you can find a set of mega variables such that the resulting graph is tree structured and the domains of the mega variables are small. But for the worst case graphs, there will be only tree structures when you have mega variables that are very large. And so the computational cost will be sitting inside those mega variables themselves, which have become very large. So it's not that this all of a sudden allows us to solve any kind of problem, but for some graphs, this will allow us to identify the structure and solve them pretty efficiently. Any questions about everything we've seen so far? Yes.
Okay, so the question was, well, of course, for these simple problems, we can just eyeball what the cut set is. But once it's a huge graph, what's the algorithm underneath that will find that for you? Um, we're not going to get into that in, in this class, but there are algorithms that can find the minimal cut set. They scale exponentially in the size of the minimal cut set. So the minimal cut set is pretty large. It'll take a long time to find that minimal cut set. Um, but if the minimal cut set is really small, you can actually find it pretty efficiently. You can imagine quite naively that you would just essentially look at every cut set of every set subset of size two, see if it's a cut set, then every subset of size three, and so forth. And you should never have consider big subsets as your candidate cut sets unless you really need one that's big. If the cut set is small. Okay. Now, of course, if the cut set is big, then it'll take a long time to find, but it'll also take a long time to do the computation afterwards. So it's, in some sense, on par the time it'll take to find the cut set and the time it'll take later to solve your problem with that cut set. Any other questions about everything we've covered so far? Because we're going to switch to a very different type of algorithm after the break. So now would be a good time to ask questions. All right, let's take a break here and then start looking at other search algorithms after the break. All right, let's restart. Any questions that might have come up during the break about the search algorithms we've seen so far for CSPs? Okay, let's look at a totally different kind of search algorithm then called iterative improvement. This is the first example of a local search algorithm. Local search is very different from the type of search we've seen so far. The type of search we've seen so far works with partial assignments. And as it progresses, completes these assignments or backtracks if it thinks it's a dead end or is sure it's a dead end. In local search, we'll actually use full assignments at all times. This is an example of a full assignment. Two variables in our CSP both have been assigned. They're violating the constraint, but it's an assignment. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll take an assignment, which can have unsatisfied constraints, naturally, because if we need to start with an assignment, initially we don't know how to find an assignment that satisfies all the constraints. That's the whole problem we're trying to solve. So we'll find some assignment somewhat arbitrary, our operators in our search now reassign values to variables. Rather than assigning a value to a variable that's not been assigned yet, we reassign. There's no fringe, no keeping track of what variables still need to be assigned. You just pick some kind of some variable, reassign it, keep going. Okay? So this is the algorithm. While the problem is not solved, you make a variable selection. Randomly select any conflicted variable is the algorithm we'll be considering here. Then you make a value selection for that variable. We'll use the min conflict heuristic. That means of all values that variable can take on, choose the value that violates the fewest constraints. It could be a tie. You arbitrarily pick one of those that has the fewest constraints violated among the ones that, have, that are in the tie. This is some kind of hill climbing. What do I mean with hill climbing? Hill climbing is this concept that you keep track of some kind of score. In this case, the score is how many constraints are violated. Sorry. In this case, yeah, hill climbing, how many scores are violated. And, well, in some sense, you're, let's look at age here. So it's different from what we've seen before. And we're improving that score by picking a new value or keeping it the same if there's nothing better than what we already had, of course. And so in this process, we can keep track of this score and see it improve over time because every step will either keep it the same or improve it. And hopefully at some point that score hits the best possible value, no constraint violations left. 
And at that point, you're done. Okay. So what would this look like? Um, here, our hill climbing score, so to say, is five because five constraints are violated. Um, here, after one change of assignment, only two are violated. One more change of assignment, only zero are violated, and we're done. So there's some kind of cost function here that measures how many constraint violations are left. Okay. Let's take a look at this in action in a demo to make sure we're all on the same page about the algorithm. So we're looking at the n queens problem, in this case n equals five. Let's run this min conflicts algorithm. So first step, randomly pick a variable among the variables that have participate in constraints that are violated. All of them participate in constraints that are violated. So we're gonna randomly pick one of them. Okay, how about we pick this one here? Now we check if we were to change the assignment, how many constraint violations would this particular variable participate in? The lowest is zero, and that's what we pick. Next, we pick a variable again. Randomly pick a variable. In fact, our random choice could be this variable again. It's not the best choice, but random doesn't care. It just picks for you. Um, then we pick this variable again. We look at which assignment makes this variable participate in the least violated constraints. It's the one we already had over here. We pick that again. All right. Now our random number generator says let's pick this variable over here. We now look at which value would result in the least constraints violated by this variable. Um, three choices. Arbitrarily pick one of them, this one here. Okay. Again, randomly pick any of the variables that has a constraint violation. Actually, we could have never picked this one because that's one that, that one's at zero, but arbitrarily pick one of the ones that has a constraint violation. Let's pick this one. Um, pick the one with the best score. There we go. Arbitrarily pick one with a constraint violation. Pick the one with the best score. Maybe we stay here. Then randomly pick this one. Pick one with the best score. Maybe pick this one here. Again, arbitrarily pick a variable that has a constraint violation. Let's say it was this one. Maybe we move um, over here. Okay, let's see if this plays out at some point. Um, here we go, and we found a solution. All right, so that's a small example. Let's look at another example. This is our map coloring problem. Let's now use the iterative improvement algorithm. Okay, the orange marked thicker edges indicate that constraint is violated with the current assignment. So let's see how this plays out. It will pick a variable that participates in a violated constraint, pick the best possible assignment for that variable, and repeat. So we see as it proceeds, less and less of these constraints are violated. At this point, it found a solution. Actually, pretty quickly. Question there. How are the colors initially assigned? You might have a some kind of idea of what might be a clever way to do the initial assignment. In this case, it would just random. Just pick some colors at random for each variable, and that's it. Okay, so that's how the algorithm works. How well can this do? It turns out on the n queens problem, using this min complex algorithm, you can solve problems in a reasonable amount of time of order n equal 10 million. That's very large. Um, same seems to be true for a lot of CSPs. If you randomly generate a constraint satisfaction problem, typically it will be solved pretty quickly with this min complex algorithm. 
turns out there's some kind of spot where the problems are slower to solve and it relates to essentially the ratio r of the number of constraints to the number of variables. If you're around that critical ratio, this algorithm tends to take a long time, or any algorithm tends to take a long time. If you're away from that critical ratio, solutions are found quickly or a proof no solution exists is found quickly. What's the intuition here? Let's say you have a very large number of constraints. And if you run a backtracking search, you'll quickly see nothing, uh, there is no valid assignment possible in this subtree, nothing valid possible in the next subtree, and so forth. And very quickly, you ruled out all possibilities. You're done. You have a certificate that there is no solution. Right. If there are almost no constraints, then this min conflicts algorithm will just kind of reassign things and pretty quickly find a solution. And same for a backtracking search. It'll pretty quickly kind of gun down, and then when it reaches the bottom, pretty much everything's a solution. It'll return a solution to you. But it's in that middle ground where it gets slow. It's in the middle ground. It's not easy to quickly rule out finding a solution, and it's not easy to find a solution because there are very few. And so that's where it tends to take a long time to, to return the answer when you're asked to solve a CSP. Um, this does bring up a question, by the way, is this local search, while it's very fast, typically, um, what if there's no solution? What will happen? It'll run forever when there's no solution. Why? It doesn't keep track of things it's tried. It's just a current assignment, changes something, changes something again, keeps going until it finds a solution, but it doesn't keep track of, oh, I already tried this, or this is a dead end, and so forth. It doesn't do any of that. So if you think there's likely no solution, running this min conflict is not going to give you a certificate of there being no solution. You might say, well, it's run for five days. That's enough. I suspect there's no solution. That's, that might be what you do in practice, but there's no guarantee at that point. Maybe you should have run it for 10 days. You will not know. What does that look like? when you're solving CSPs in the real world. What does the real world look like? Kind of, you know, there is a lot of green pastry. There are some bad spots where the problems are hard. And if you work on problems that you encounter a lot in AI, you'll be living right here where everything's hard, okay? So you will need all these tricks that we've seen and ideally more than the tricks that even exist to solve your problem. Okay, so in summary, constraint satisfaction problems are a very special type of search problem. They have many applications, and so we've looked at a special search algorithm that's tailored to solving CSPs. But keep in mind, in principle, you could run the search algorithms from lecture two and three for CSPs. They just won't be as efficient because they won't exploit the specific structure here. Our solution was backtracking search with speed ups based on ordering, filtering, and structure. Those are the standard search algorithms. You could also use a local search. And iterative min conflicts is an example of a local search. And this will often find solutions very quickly in practice if solutions exist. But it's not a complete algorithm. It's in, well, it, because it doesn't keep track of what it's tried. And so it might not, and it might not tell you when no solution exists. OK, so local search. I should rephrase that. Min conflicts, if, if your randomness is good, it will be complete. It could just take infinitely long if you're unlucky with your random sequence before it finds a solution. So in that sense, it, it is complete, but it will not tell you when no solution exists, which can be a problem if no solution exists. OK, local search. We just saw an example of a local search algorithm. It turns out it's useful beyond for solving CSPs. So what was the idea here? Rather than having a tree structure that keeps track of what you've explored, what you haven't explored, you just have a single option of what you're currently looking at. Your successor function is not an assignment to a variable that's unassigned. Your successor function is changing the assignment to one of the variables. It's very memory efficient because all you keep in memory is just your current assignment. And in general, it can be very, very fast. Um, so. The general idea here is one of hill climbing. That's not specific to CSPs. It's a, the idea is that you have some kind of cost function or some kind of scoring metric. And for any assignment to your, all your variables, you can evaluate the quality of that assignment. 
you start anywhere and then you just try to find a better state from there by changing something about what you currently have. Um, a neighbor state is what is kind of near you. So let's say a change of assignment to one variable could be what you define as your neighbor states. Um, so you just kind of keep going until you find no better neighbors. At that point, you quit. Maybe you start with a new random assignment, run it again, and keep, keep doing this until you find something that you're happy with, right? The way to think of this is that you are on some kind of mountain where you mountainous terrain you've never been before. It's super foggy, you can't see anything, but you can feel which direction is uphill, which direction is downhill just around you. And then you take a step in the, in the uphill direction, then you repeat, you feel out which direction is uphill, and keep going. This could be a strategy to reach the top of a mountain, right? You might not reach the top of the highest mountain because you might be on a small mountain as you start out and reach the top of that small mountain and so forth. But it is a strategy to keep going. You only look locally around yourself to decide where you're headed. So is this complete? Well, um, you, it, it really, Depends a little bit on the type of search problem you're solving, but in general, this will not be complete. You're not guaranteed to find the optimal solution. You might get stuck somewhere in a local optimum, where locally you cannot improve, um, but there is something better somewhere out there. You're at the wrong mountaintop, and you're just stuck locally, right? Um, is it optimal? Well, even when you find some kind of solution. It's not clear what solution means here. You find you return something, it's not guaranteed to be optimal. You could just return something that's actually pretty low compared to the best mountain top. So what's, what's good about it, it's very, very fast, right? As you can run this repeatedly with different starting points and hopefully at some point you hit a starting point from where you find a good solution and then you solve the original problem in a good way. So how can this all shake out? Let's say this is your current state, you go uphill, you end up over here, that's a local maximum. From that point, there's no way to improve locally. Um, so that's, that's a local maximum. In all, any direction you move, it gets worse. Here, this is a flat local maximum where in any direction you move, things stay the same. So it's a flat. Here's a different kind of flat where actually you should keep moving, but locally when you look around yourself, it's flat and so you don't know in which direction to move. This is what we call the global maximum. It's where you ideally would end up. And of course, there are other, there are really bad places like the local minima over here where you really don't want to end up. So let's take a look at what do we understand how this shakes out. Let's assume we start from X, which is over here. We run hill climbing on this simple one-dimensional problem. Where do we end up? B, because we'll climb all the way to the top here. That's B. Starting from Y, where do we end up if we run hill climbing? D, we just go till here and it stops here because from there you don't know where to go. Can't improve anymore. Starting from Z, where do you end up? Z is over here. Go up here. You actually achieve the global optimum where you want to be. All right. Now, in this one-dimensional plot, you might say, this isn't too bad. You know, I could just really sweep left to right and find the best spot. Um, or you could say, when I'm in a on a flat zone, I just split my program into two threads. One goes left, the other one goes right. And one of them will do the right thing because there's only two options. Um, but keep in mind that this is just a picture in 1D. In reality, you're solving problems that are in hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of dimensions. And in all of those millions of directions, these possibilities can occur where things are flat, go up, go down, and so forth, and you can have, so the scenario is a lot more complicated than something you can just sweep out left to right. So this getting stuck in local optima is a real problem, or getting stuck on flats is a real problem when you solve the real world problems. Okay, so what's a way around this? We've seen one way around, which is random restarts. Here's another way, simulated annealing. So what's the idea here? It is that, well, if you're in a bad um, local optimum, you want to shake yourself loose somehow. Make a random move 
then perturbs yourself out of that local optimum. Now you're on the upslope of a different bigger mountain, so to say, and you move on from there and maybe you find the top of that mountain. Okay. That's the idea. How do you do this in an algorithm? Um, the way simulated annealing formalizes this, it has a temperature schedule. So temperature is this thing where you say, think of particles moving around like in an ideal gas, right? If the temperature is very high, particles move very fast. Temperature is very low, things actually freeze over and it's not a gas anymore, everything has become solid. So think of temperature exactly in that meaning. Initially there's a lot of random motion, later there's less and less random motion. So the most naive algorithm would say, I initially a lot of random motion, so I decide often to make a random move but usually to make a, but every now and then to make a clever move, that's a hill climbing move. And the more temperature goes down, the more I make just the hill climbing move, the less the random move. That'd be a simple approach. Simulated annealing is a little more sophisticated about how it decides to make random moves or not. So what it does, when it picks a successor, it picks it randomly, okay? Now, this is just a potential successor. It evaluates it whether it wants a successor or not. If that successor, which is randomly picked, it could be uphill or downhill, or equally good. If it's better, it keeps it. It says, Let, let's keep this. If it's worse, it's just locally worse. It might be edging you towards something better somewhere further away. So you might, this doesn't want to just discard something that locally looks worse. It'll look at how much it's worse. And then it'll flip a coin. And the probability of accepting it will be lower the worse it is and higher the less worse it is. And temperature will modulate this probability. So when there is still high temperature, something that's much worse will still have a reasonable probability of being picked. And as you cool down, something that, that's much worse will still have a non-zero probability of being picked, but it'll be a very small probability. And so over time, the bad moves are less and less likely to be accepted. The good moves always get accepted, and you can actually show that this has some guarantees. So the stationary distribution is something we'll see later, meaning if you were to run this infinitely long, on average, where would you spend your time is given by the probability of spending your time at a point X is given by this equation over here, which is that high, in it, high E states, high scoring states have a higher probability down low scoring states. And that's what you want, okay? If you decrease your T slowly enough, because the, the lower T, the more that probability is peaked around the good states. If T is zero, everything's equal. Uh, sorry, if T is infinity, everything's equal. If T goes to zero, it's peaked around the best, single best or tied for best states. So if T goes to zero, you do it slowly enough, you actually are guaranteed that it does converge to this distribution, you would find the optimal solution, which is great. Um, slowly enough, uh, unfortunately, means really, really slowly. And that essentially pretty much infinitely slowly, you never have time to do it that slowly. But in practice, people find decaying the temperature at some kind of reasonable rate will still work pretty well on a lot of problems. Okay? So, while this might sound a little bit like magic, that this kind of just knows when to jump away, when, when to jump to good places and so forth, keep in mind that if you want to make it to a different, bigger hill or mountain, so to say, and you have to go downhill for that, the longer your sequence of downhill moves, the lower the probability that you would accept that sequence of downhill moves. And so it could take a really long time before that low probability event finally happens, and finally you move to that different mountain where you can go uphill the big mountain. Um, so a lot of what people spend time on is find ridge operators, which essentially means that you find ways to choose neighbors in a slightly different way than just the nearest neighbors, so you can somehow escape these bad local spots more easily. All right, here's another way to do search that is a little different from what we've seen so far. It's still local search, but you keep a pool of current assignments rather than just one current assignment. It's called genetic algorithms. Think of it like, imagine that somehow we're all part of a big search algorithm. Somebody is running on us, hoping to find this superhuman that ultimately emerges after billions of years, or maybe it's not a human, it's yet something else beyond us. Um, 
This is effectively what, what inspires this algorithm. You have assignments, you have a score for them. Based on the score, there's a probability that you retain each assignment, okay? Then the ones that are retained get to procreate together into new assignments, just like I guess humans would procreate and most, most animals um, if you need a male and a female. So you get uh, some kind of chromosome crossover effect happening where you get new instances that are um, some kind of combination, recombination of the old ones, and then you repeat, okay? So this technique is very appealing from kind of a high level point of view. It's not always applicable. In fact, often it's not applicable you need to be very careful about when you apply it, but it has its applicability. A big question is, when does it make sense to apply this technique? It makes a lot of sense when different parts of your instantiation contribute to the scoring function somewhat independently. So if half of the board can be solved fairly independently of the other half of the board, then you can take a half of the board and reuse it. But if everything is heavily intertwined, it might be a lot harder to get something like this to work. All right, that's it for CSPs. Next time we'll look at games.